Hello, folks, and welcome to session two here uh, on this FinTech Summit. In this session, we're going to be looking at what role the financial services industry has actually played during the pandemic, and perhaps more importantly, what role it might play in any future recovery. Our first speaker is David Bumslag, who's a senior analyst from the Bank of England. So, David, over to you. Today is to um, give you a flavour of what we're currently focusing on and a perspective of developments both during the pandemic and beyond. Uh, I'll look at how FinTech has got us through the lockdown, the experience of non-bank lenders and some future themes. Now, I work in an area called financial stability risk or FSSR as we like to call it, at the Bank of England. Our role is to support the Bank of England's Financial Policy Committee and other areas of the bank to ensure the UK financial system is resilient to and also prepared for the wide range of possible risks it could face. And our overall aim is that the system can serve UK households and businesses in bad times as well as in good. And increasingly, fintech plays a vital role in this. Understanding and applying fintech is a strategic priority for the bank. We aim to enable innovation and empower competition at the same time keeping our core objectives, which are monetary stability in mind. As such, the Bank of England has set up a fintech hub which seeks to ensure a steady focus on analysing the policy implications of fintech across the spectrum of what the bank does, taking steps as well to apply fintech to enhance our own capacities where appropriate. But the fintech hub is very much, as it says, it's a hub. As the role of fintech becomes ever greater, people from across the bank are working closely together to understand the implications for different aspects of the bank's mission. As previous speakers have said, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the use of technology across the economy. And this contrasts dramatically with the previous major epidemic to hit the UK the 1918 flu pandemic. And I've got here a bit of public health information from around 1918. Tools to combat epidemics have surprisingly not changed too much since then. Isolating infectious individuals and encouraging them to stay at home and hygiene are still the main tools. But there's one significant difference. There's no mention of working from home. Clearly, the opportunities to socially distance have significantly increased in a manufacturing driven economy with densely occupied workspaces. Social distancing was much more challenging than it is today. There was simply going to work to keep the economy going. The technologies we have nowadays have quite literally saved lives. A fintech has also played a role in this. Some of the key technologies are so embedded in our way of life that we hardly even think of them as fintech at all. But many of them are not all that old. So these include things like electronic credit scoring and allowing new products to be provided without the need for physical documents. Internet and mobile banking. And mobile banking has particularly taken off with over 6 million new digital banking app downloads in the UK from the 14th of March to the 14th of April 2020. Even the humble ATM. But these recent... Um, these have also been joined by more recent trends. So, so, more rapid delivery of SME finance, 
and increasing demands for remote and digital identification. A particularly good example is digital payments. There's been a persistent decline in the use of cash over the past decade. Now, I don't expect that to surprise you, but nonetheless, the statistics are quite striking. So in 2019, cash accounted for 23% of consumer and business payments. And that's 8% in 2009, so just over 10 years. The decline over the most recent years has been primarily driven by the adoption of debit card and contactless payments which account for 42% and 21% of all payments, respectively. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated those trends. Amid reports that banknotes and coins could carry the coronavirus, the demand for cash plummeted. And as societies adopted social distancing measures, the demand for contactless payments there was even a sharp decline in cash withdrawals in the UK. They fell by around 60% on average between the week ending 29th of March and the week ending 26th of April. At the same time, around 30% of transactions were online in April 2020, and that compares to 18% the previous year. Although several fintech solutions have been branded as payment products, Private payments innovation as a direct result of the pandemic are limited and small scale. For example, a couple of firms have launched a companion card, which allows trusted helpers to collect essentials for vulnerable individuals using a second debit card. But we think the current environment is right for future innovation. More generally, the experience of the pandemic is likely to favor those firms whose business models are attuned to the digital economy. And we at the Bank of England are really keen to support this while ensuring, as I think some other speakers have talked about, that financial inclusion is maintained and people not left behind by this transition. A specific area of focus for us recently, non-bank lenders, including P2P lenders. Now these lenders provide a relatively small but meaningful amount of lending to the real economy. While they have mod modest market shares, they tend to focus on niches that are not that well served by mainstream banks. Many such firms operate innovative fintech driven models to address such niches. Disruption to wholesale markets during the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in liquidity stress as they typically rely on funding from banks the securitization markets, or in the case of P2P retail investors. While disruption to this sector was unlikely to threaten financial stability, it did have the potential to reduce access to credit for some borrowers. For instance, non-bank lenders provide 20 billion of credit to SMEs. This raised concerns for the UK authorities as to whether these firms would have access to the lending they needed. Non-bank lenders have been eligible for the British Business Bank's loan schemes and are significantly credited to the scheme. Evidence from our agency contacts has indicated that this has enabled non-bank lenders to continue to be a valuable source of finance to their customers, particularly through the so-called C-Bill scheme. And that's also been due to their ability to serve specific customer groups effectively and to turn around requests quickly and more efficiently than many mainstream banks. They turn these to continue to provide employment and maintain economic activity. The pandemic has highlighted both the opportunities and the challenges for FinTech in the way ahead. And I want to flag a few areas for consideration going forward. There are a number of initiatives already in train at the Bank of England. The Future of Finance report, which came out in 2019 and was led by Hugh Van Steenis, explored a number of trends and set some um, priority areas as shown in the slides 
um, that I'm displaying at the moment. Now, um, payments has been an area of dramatic innovation in recent years. The established pattern of a few established payment providers is evolving into a much more decentralized system. In 2019, we've, we estimated that of the top 100 UK firms by valuation in fintech, 50% were in payments. And this creates some exciting possibilities, particularly in areas such as cross-border payments, where costs are currently very high. But it also creates challenges, as I've mentioned above, for ensuring access. Three key recommendations in the Van Steenis report were to review payments regulation and ensure that it currently is fit for purpose and it continues to be in this new payments environment. It's one where instead of these few players, we're having to deal with a much more complex setup. He also recommended that we provide more coordinated leadership to manage the impact of digital payments. And finally, to help diverse, diversify the payment options in the UK, exploring any hurdles to replicate the success of solutions like mobile pay by bank that exist in other countries and that could challenge the success of the established payment networks, which are driven by cards. Most recently, that's resulted in the Treasury announcing a review of the payments landscape. Reviews currently are a vital part in enabling payments innovation to take place while maintaining financial res resilience. Since the Future of Finance report, we've also been aiming to develop the con concept of a portable credit file. And this would enable SMEs to collect their data on an open platform, and that would allow them to shop around to ensure that they have more competitive and diverse sources of finance. Banks often struggle to assess the credit worthiness of small businesses, and many business owners view applying for loans as time consuming and complicated. As a result, even before the pandemic, small businesses in the UK suffered from an estimated 22 billion funding gap. And during the pandemic, borrowers found it difficult to access loans unless they had an existing relationship with a lender. The model we imagine is based on using a standardized set of APIs to move data around the financial system at the request of the SME. We're working with the Treasury to take this concept forward. And additionally, in March 2020, the Bank of England published a paper on open da data for SME finance, which proposed potential building blocks for an open pay platform from SMEs. I now want to turn to some additional future challenges that the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed. And I'll just discuss these briefly. The crisis has highlighted the importance of liquidity and funding for all players in financial markets, including fintechs. Many firms came under a lot of stress as they found it was much more difficult raised from suppliers of finance. So firms may need to think carefully about whether they are robust to extreme and unexpected scenarios and how they ensure the availability of funding in the future, potentially through innovative approaches. Then there's data. So surprisingly, with organizations powered by data, there's a lack of consistent or reliable data sources on the fintech industry itself. This reflects the recent origin and dynamic nature of the sector. But nonetheless, it poses a challenge for those of us, including the Bank of England, trying to understand the role of fintechs and their contribution to the economy, and for policymakers in thinking about whether there is a need for intervention. There's definitely scope for further work, and that's whether it's led by industry or the public authorities. Finally, just as with payments, the existing regulatory framework is based on the idea of a relatively stable set of functions within the financial services industry. 
as the financial system continues to evolve, the bank regulation, including through its Risk Beyond Banking annual review, which looks across the financial system to identify how the changing landscape might affect financial stability. I expect that the fintech sector will continue to be an area that we look at very closely in the coming years. Going back to my introduction, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown that technology has the capacity not just to transform our lives, but literally to save them. We look forward to future developments, and this will continue to be a major focus of our efforts across the whole of the Bank of England. Thank you very much for your time and attention. David, thank you very much for that. Um, a lot to think about there. David Baumslag, the Senior Analyst for the Bank of England. Now, I'm quoting directly from David here. He says, we feel that the climate is right for future innovation. Now, how do you drive that innovation? Is it actually possible to drive innovation? Well, our next speaker certainly believes so, uh, which is just as well, because he's Innovation Manager for Lloyd's Banking Group, David McClay. David, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction. Very nice link there as well. So, yes, good morning, everyone. Um, Today, I'm going to talk about um, driving innovation in challenging times, as Mark said there. So that's going to cover a few things. So we're going to look at the topic of innovation uh, in its kind of broad sense, uh, specifically then what we do in Lloyd's Banking Group today, uh, and then talk a little bit about how things have changed and uh, what we're going to do about that. So um, why innovate? Um, it's a fair question. Um, well, I think it's, uh, the picture speaks for itself, really, and it's human nature uh, to look for better ways for doing things. Um, I think that's good. It'd be pretty boring otherwise if we just stayed doing the same thing all the time. So, you know, looking to try new things, find new ways of doing things, I think is a bit of a no-brainer. Um, I work for a large financial services organisation. I work for Lloyds Banking Group. Um, and quite often, there is a bit of resistance to that change. You know, you, you might come across the team in charge of the square wheels here, um, and they're pretty happy with their lot, really. You know, they get their rocks from A to B. Um, it works. Um, doesn't go too fast around corners. You know, you know why change? But um, I think generally, um, the current climate, you're sort of pushing on an open door with an innovation team. People do want to try new things, and uh, they're keen to do that in Lloyds and elsewhere. Um, if we look historically, uh, it hasn't always been the case. So, you know, a quick history lesson here, if I may. Um, look at a few innovations throughout the ages. Uh, we have the umbrella there on the top left. So this, this came to the UK in the 1700s, a chap called Jonas Hanway. He brought it from France, I, I believe. And um, people didn't like it at first. They shouted names at him and they threw things at him. Um, and that included coach drivers who felt a bit threatened by this guy with the umbrella. and People wouldn't go in their coaches. So perhaps a lesson there that some people will be resistant um, just purely because of the situation that they're in. Um, if we look at coffee, um, you'd think that would be pretty simple. Nobody would be worried. But um, in the 1500s, people thought it was similar to uh, alcohol and induced systems, symptoms like drunkenness. So they're a little bit worried. And they actually thought coffee houses were um, thought to be meeting places for revolutionaries. Viva Cafe Nero, you might say. Um, the light bulb, even, surely. The light bulb, everybody would appreciate that, you'd think. But um, in 18... 78, uh, a Brittany committee said, uh, this may be good enough for our transatlantic friends, but it's unworthy of the attention of practical or scientific men. So there you go. The British Parliament making good decisions for 142 years, you might think. Um, and I was going to talk about uh, vaccinations and say they're obviously a good thing, but you know maybe in the current climate, we haven't quite got over that hurdle yet, and there's, there's still some anti-vaccinators out there. So... Moving forward a little bit in uh, sort of current times, um, this is the environment we're used to in, in our team and in innovation and insurance. Um, lots happening. Uh, our competitors and ourselves are, are, are up to lots of things, trying new things. Uh, the market's ripe for disruption, in, in, in my view. Um, we have we sell products that customers struggle to see the value in. You know, if you have life insurance, home insurance. It, it becomes a bit of a grudge purchase where you're looking for the cheapest price, really, uh, and people don't necessarily think they get value from that. Uh, we have an environment where there's a lot of new technology, 
opening up opportunities. We have internet of things, devices in the home, uh, like Leapbot there that Aviva are trying and, and we tried two or three years ago uh, as a little test to see how customers like that. Um, and there's also a lot of new sources of data. Um, so we have health and fitness trackers, we have those IT devices. We have a number of things that give us initial data that we can think how we can improve things for customers uh, using those sources of data. So it's a very, um, it's a very exciting marketplace to work in and it's a, a very interesting one. So if we look a little bit um, around specifically um, how we work in, in Lloyd's Banking Group and innovation, um, and my granny used to say that self-praise is no praise, but I'm going to ignore that and say I think we've done pretty well in our team to date. Uh, we've been around for a few years now, started late 2016. Um, to date, and the way we work is as you can see from the slide, we, we try and identify companies that we can engage with that we think have got good ideas. We explore those a little bit, some initial customer research and, and talk to the companies and see if their roadmap kind of suits where we're, we're trying to get to. And then hopefully the most exciting bit what our team does is we run proof of concepts, we run experiments. Um, so we devise these and run them with either customers or we have 65,000 colleagues in Moise Banking Group, so quite often we'll, we'll try things with colleagues first. Um, as a proxy for customers. And right to the, the right-hand side of the slide there, um, we like to get things live. So the whole point of us doing it is to, to get things in the hands of customers and to change what they do. So the more we get to the right, um, the better. So I think we have a, a proven established model there. Um, it's well-received uh, with our business colleagues, and we do get some things live, but the, you know, there's definitely a room for improvement. And, and a couple of things I'm going to call out um, things can take a long time. Uh, Lloyd's Banking Group, you see Trove there, for example. Um, we first identified Trove late 2016, and it wasn't until December 2019 that that was live on halifax.co.uk. So if you go to Halifax today, go to their website today and try and buy contents insurance, that will be powered by Trove. So, so it's there and it works, and it's well received, but, you know, three and a bit years, it's too long, right? We need, we need to go a bit faster. And secondly, um, we try a lot of things, which is great and, and it's fun, um, but the left-hand side of the funnel is pretty overloaded compared to the right-hand side of the funnel. So we need to try and think a little bit about um, how we can be a bit more targeted and get more things through effectively. So they're the challenges we're facing generally, uh, and we're, we're all set to deal with that. But then, well... Things have changed. Times they are changing, as the slide says there, and I'll spare you my Bob Dylan on the harmonica. Uh, and it's not escaped your attention, I'm sure. We're, we're nine months into a global pandemic, and, and things are different, very different, in fact. So the Moise Banking Group, very limited access to our offices now, uh, only really emergency people who, who need to go in, who can't work from home. Uh, we have a new operating model. Uh, it's you know remote management of colleagues and, and it's just a little bit different and, and increasingly customers are, are switching to digital channels we find so how do we have we addressed that so far so not just the offices we have four and a half thousand colleagues in insurance and wealth who were in one day and not in the next day and, and effectively we had to spin up a, a very quick program where we got laptops out to all these guys uh, and let them take calls at home you know, we did that within three weeks, uh, which was an amazing sort of team effort. Um, the remote work management, the new operating model has given us some challenges. Uh, it's obviously different from managing a team in a physical location. You, you can't see them. There, there's, there's that lack of kind of team, team spirit. So we've managed to roll out Microsoft Teams to all these colleagues. And we've also used um, some no-code technologies to, to build new apps to help the kind of colleague management aspect of that operating model. And we've set up a team of non-developers to do that, non-software developers, um, and we've created these apps in about four weeks. It's taken us to get live with our first app, which is pretty impressive. Um, our customers obviously don't go to branches anymore. They're increasingly switching to digital channels. They've had to. They've no choice in the matter, really. And to support that, we managed to roll out a chatbot on scottishwidows.co.uk in a couple of weeks. So that's taken some of the, the demand of our telephony centres and giving customers a 24-7 channel where they can get some answers, get pointed in the right direction and, and help them out effectively. Um, I think, as I said, you know, an amazing team effort to, 
to address these changing times. And uh, I think it showed a few things. So it showed three things, really. Um, helps if I flip the side on for you, but not to worry. Uh, it shows three things. Um, we can move and take decisions quickly when we need to. Um, they say necessity is the mother of invention, and I think we've, we've proven that there, that when we've really had to, people make decisions and you get things done. Uh, and we've also proven that you know we can try new tech at scale. You know, a rollout of MS Teams, a rollout of no-code technologies. We got it out there and we got it in front of thousands of people um, in a number of weeks. And thirdly, and importantly, we've proven that we can do all this in a way that's safe and it, and it meets the risk appetite of the bank um, or the banking group, which is, which is relatively low uh, uh, for historic reasons. But people are happy. You know, people in our, in our risk and our architectural technology teams are happy with what we've done and how we've done it. And then um, we've proven that it is safe. So that works. Now, how we innovate in this changing environment um, is obviously uh, another challenge. So what we have done, um, we effectively, as of today, we're launching our own um, innovation incubator in partnership with FinTech Scotland. So you go fintechscotland.com forward slash launch, and you can read all about it. Uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, <laughs> I encourage you to do so. Um, but this is the it's the focus on a couple of areas of concern that we had. So we want to be more targeted in, in how we innovate at Lloyds Bank Group. We want to focus on the key strategic challenges. You know, as we move into next year, for all our companies, um, there won't be quite as much investment spend. We'll need to be a bit more focused. There's obviously a lot of other work to do to, to handle COVID and, the, and uh, the impacts of it. So we're going to focus on our key strategic challenges, and they're shown there, the key themes around the environmental, social, and governance issues, and also improving our digital services around some key product areas, um, primarily financial well-being for our, our pensions customers, um, and also we want to support our kind of share dealing business unit. Um, but what we've realized is that we need to do it slightly differently. We need to be more collab collaborative, easy for me to say. So not only are we going to partner with FinTech Scotland, but I think more importantly, in fact, much more importantly, we want to collaborate with the FinTechs and the companies that involve themselves. So we've realized we need to do this together and we need to give something back. Um, so what we want to do is through our incubator is effectively help these companies grow and develop their ideas together with us and then work in a sustainable way sort of going forward. Um, and as well as that, we want to move faster. You know, we've realized that we can do things quickly and we want to keep doing that. So we're going to work with 12 companies over 12 weeks to introduce some new ideas in a Lloyds Banking Group. Uh, and the, the final thing about this is it's a new way of working. Um, so we'll learn from it, you know, and next time we'll do it better. But this is our, our first go at it. And, uh, yeah, hopefully you've got the website, take a little look at it. And uh, please do feedback uh, what you think. So very exciting. And as I say, we go live today. So very interesting. Okay, so <clears throat> just to conclude, um, what have we seen around innovation and what do we need to do differently? So it's definitely a new environment. So the, it's been called internally and I suspect externally as well, you know, business unusual, um, and we're going to have to get used to it. But we've shown we can change and we've shown we can do new things to react and get them live in a safe way. So that gives us comfort that we can do what we're, what we're seeking out to do. Um, and secondly, we, we've realized we need to, to grow and speed up our innovation. You know, we, we only need to get faster and, and do more. And, and that's what our incubator wants to do. In a targeted, methodical way, we want to explore a number of ideas at pace and then test them with customers and colleagues and, and hopefully get them live. And the third point there, really, we, we can't do it ourselves. So we want to and we think we should, you know, collaborate across the, the broader sector. Uh, so we've talked about FinTech Scotland. We also want to collaborate with academia. We've got reasonable um, got good relationships, apologies, with the um, University of Edinburgh and Strathclyde University. Um, and we want to take that further. And we also want to collaborate with the various fintechs and, and find a way that we can help them. In a big bank, there's certain things we're good at and certain things we're bad at. We want the fintechs to help the things we're bad at. But there's probably a lot of things we are good at that we can help help fintechs kind of grow. Um, and that, that is the aim of our incubator. So, Hope you've enjoyed the talk. Um, 
ran through it a little bit. Um, just about kept up with the, the right slides. Uh, if you've got any questions, you know, please do put them into the Q&A and, and I'll happily take them uh, later on. But thank you very much. David, thank you very much for that. Um, and as, as he rightly points out, uh, if you have any questions at all, go to the bottom of your screen. There's a wee box there, just click on that and submit the questions either generally to the panel, because there won't be a chance to put questions to any of the speakers in this session, uh, or to a particular individual, if it's, if it's pretty targeted. Uh, and I like that. I mean, it's a very pragmatic approach to innovation and just trying things and giving it a go and you know, trying to speed up the entire process where that was safe. I work for a big organisation, and it, I would say it's reasonably risk averse too. Um, you know, it's one of those organisations where you know there are no problems, there are challenges. You know, there are opportunities, and opportunity is one of those words that after a while you start ducking whenever you hear it. To be honest, our next speaker, Leda Glyptus, is former CEO of Eleven FS Foundry, and Leda wants to talk about the problem with opportunity. So, Leda. Hello, and thank you very much for having me. It's always um, it's always great to uh, to go last because you get to hear everyone else's presentations and go, oh yeah, that's good. I wish I had thought about that, but now I don't have to because uh, someone else has covered it. And I think it's quite apt um, to come at the uh, at the end of those two presentations because um, my my um, my presentation is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, I want to talk about the the problem with opportunity and focus on the problem rather than the opportunity because we've heard a lot about the opportunity and I will touch on it. It's not going to be all pessimism all the time, um, but I want to focus on how easy it would be to miss the opportunity and why. So uh, since we're talking uh, about cliches, I want to start with one. We talk about opportunity all the time. It's comforting and it helps us deal with chaos. Um, this is one of the quotes I have seen more than um, changes the new normal, I think, but only marginally so. The, the hope and belief that disruption and chaos um, come with an upside, they come with a gift, they come with a, a, a condolence or um, a consolation prize in the shape of opportunity. So let's... let's um, Let's talk about that. Let's talk about both chaos and opportunity um, in ways that I hope will tie in with what my previous um, colleagues spoke about and will open up to a few challenging and meaningful questions. So let's start with chaos. And the thing about chaos is that it's very easy for us to talk about chaos in the middle of the pandemic. We are facing so much disruption, but the word chaos, even though not entirely um, appropriate, um, is actually relevant to how we feel, right? So let's, let's accept it and embrace it and say that in the middle of this pandemic that seems to go longer than anyone had feared or anticipated, that has had um, sweeping consequences on everything from our ways of working, I was, was touch, um, touched on earlier, to the uh, realizations around the shortcomings of our technology, to our interpersonal relationships, for those who have children at home, to the challenges both for what parenting entails, but also what their future entails. On a personal, organizational, and nat national level, the pandemic has created problems that compounded with each other have been described by a lot um, as chaos. And that came on top of what we have long described as the new normal, to use another cliche, in our industry. And I just want to flag it because um, I have been in, in, this, in this space. We called it transformation at first and then innovation. But whatever you call it, the space of trying to catch up with ourselves, to bring technology into business in a way that will allow continued relevance. I've been in this game for coming up to 20 years now. And we've been talking about the new normal and disruption every year as if it was a surprise. The new normal is old, but it's no less unsettling because we haven't quite cracked it, despite some of the best intentions and best efforts of all the organizations in this space. And I'm not getting myself out of it. My last gig in the work I currently do is on the technology startup side, but I have been a banker myself for a long time. I have set up and run transformation and innovation teams. So I'm not taking myself out of this at all, right? Um, but the other, the other thing I want to I want to add and 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 dwell on a bit is that there is a little bit of chaos of our own making in, in the financial services industry, and by that I mean all the things we didn't fix when we thought we had time. 
Uh, I have worked in a number of organizations, and I'm sure people in our audience have, that had a lot of uh, growth and acquisition legacy systems that were never normalized because it was okay. The time and money and people were plentiful. Um, there are structures and uh, compliance requirements that are dated that are making everyday life difficult, but we never got around to fixing them because there were other things that were more urgent. So the reason we're looking aghast at the situation now and we're trying to focus on the opportunity is that we have all these layers of complexity, even if you don't want to call it chaos, complexity that compounds on top of each other and makes doing the jobs that all of you are doing inside big banks exceptionally hard. Now, before I, uh, I'll put my cards on the table and say I will be beating on the banks a little bit, but not on the people within them. Because what we have seen is that incredible innovation and creativity has come out of banks, despite all these compounding factors making life difficult. Um, and it is exactly because of those efforts and that work that we're beginning to talk about opportunity. Uh, let me take uh, the lending example that was touched on earlier. Every single organization globally had some government provision affecting uh, loan holidays, mortgage holidays, uh, repayment schedules, or uh, interest rate changes. The government dictated that certain changes should be made, and the banks rallied. And actually, within a window of some confusion and delay, every single bank did it and did so um, largely well. What the consumer couldn't see is that the vast majority of those banks were scrambling to create uh, layers to their system to change code that in some cases is older than me and create um, hacks essentially and, and, and shortcuts that will allow for those changes that seem very simple to be made in systems that are just not set up that way. Um, when we look back and say, oh, look, you know, those changes were requested. And rather than taking the six months we thought they would take, they took eight weeks. There is an opportunity for accelerating innovation and digitization. I say, well, ask the people who didn't sleep for those eight weeks because they were trying to make changes to COBOL based systems and ask them how they feel about this opportunity. Now, before I go into what's holding us back, Let's talk about the opportunity because I do think it exists and I think it's immense. And I think it's threefold and it, and it sort of touches and builds on what was said earlier. We have done innovation for a long time and we have done it slowly for good reason. Banks are custodians of assets of great value, great value to the individual, my grandmother's pension, should I have a grandmother, um, my mortgage, the savings of families, but also uh, the power of global finance, infrastructure projects, the regulatory and compliance environment has held us back with good reason. However, we've gotten to that pivotal point where the technology is robust enough, we know it works, and the regulator is much more comfortable with certain things and in fact leading the dance and, and, and pushing for speed. But for reasons that have more to do with business priorities, the way innovation departments are set up, competitive structures, margin compressions and all the rest, the sort of innovation we had hoped for uh, by now hasn't quite happened. So for a lot of us, Inside the industry, as, as, as the Davids mentioned earlier, the opportunity is for a lot of those things to become more themselves, right? There is an opportunity for delivery acceleration. Why is there an opportunity? Well, because there is an urgent need for it from a, a community perspective, a user perspective, a business perspective. We are all seeing that the things that were on the pipeline now have to happen faster. Um, we saw that the three, six, eight, ten months that some projects could potentially take are not acceptable anymore. The acceleration is needed. It's a matter of, of survival, not just for the business, but for the communities we serve. The second thing is focus. And I don't just mean focus to two projects rather than 100. I mean business focus. One of the things that the, um, the pandemic has forced everyone to do is focus on core on the things that are central to what we do, not nice to have, not creative projects on the side. And that business focus, as I'm sure my innovation uh, lead clients, um, uh, 
colleagues even would agree, is something that the innovation teams are always desperate for. Put me at the heart of the business and I will make miracles for you. Miracles that have a lot of hard work and long hours behind them, but miracles indeed. Align the creativity and the innovation efforts with business deliverables. And there is very good reason to believe that the pressure to continue doing so under COVID will continue. The third piece is execution commitment. One of the saddest things about all the efforts um, that innovation teams um, carry out is that very often they don't see the light of day. They meet their delivery requirements, they meet their proof of concept of proof of value requirements, and still for whatever reason when it comes to putting um, money behind them or effort behind them in earnest, that commitment focuses to something uh, that is either aligned to regulatory pressures or uh, has higher business priority. The fact that we know that the pressures that COVID has brought are not going to dissipate and digital delivery will be the most valuable um, investment that a bank can make will actually give that execution commitment that innovation uh, teams have lacked. So from a consumer perspective, a regulator perspective, a techie perspective, and an innovator's perspective, the opportunity is huge to do all the things we knew we needed, all the things we knew where the cultural side of, of getting innovation to stick, um, that, was, that was always hard. And all the things that we know, once we have them, we can bring acceleration. Now, what's the problem? Everything I have said is a good thing, right? Good for the consumer, good for the business, good for the bank, good for the people. The problem is manifold. The first problem is this, and I did not design it. I'm sure you've seen this, uh, this um, a million times before. The main problem is, infrastructure. Every single bank, no matter their efforts around creating digital capabilities, has not gone all the way down in either their design or execution. So even though efforts have been made to go further than the odd project here and the odd project there, and I would say proudly that the vast majority of banks I'm interacting with have meaningful transformation work that goes much beyond the glass and the experience, it's still not all the way down. And there are vulnerabilities, either from a security perspective or from a stability perspective or from a real-time capability perspective that are either what we call user-defined and user-driven technologies or systems um, and pieces of code that are, and I quote, again, a CTO I work with, older than me and I'm 42. Um, and that creates vulnerability and weakness, right? And that is a problem we're aware of. That's not a secret. I am not telling anyone here something they don't know. But I want to spend um, the remainder of my time on, on how this dovetails with the opportunity to aggressively accelerate digitization, because essentially therein lies the problem with opportunity. And let me pick on a few things, and I would love to hear uh, questions and thoughts and reactions and disagreements if they exist. So I think there, there are several problems with the opportunity that is undeniable there. The first set of problems is how we work inside big organizations, how we have historically solved problems. What we did as an industry during the pandemic is the oldest story in the book. We hadn't invested in the right technology, so we threw people at the problem. And those people did incredible work. Some of the um, loan disbursement plugins and, and, and new platforms that were stood up in the space of a few weeks were amazing. But it was not the technology investment that we could have and should have made over the last 20 years. It was humans who didn't sleep for weeks on end and worked weekends and long, long hours. If we have to learn one thing from this difficulty is that this is no longer viable. Give those humans the space and time while we have it to create solutions that are deeper, wider, and more sustainable. But we're not doing it right now. And why are we not doing it? Part of the reason is how we measure success. For better or worse, despite everything that happened and despite the honesty with which bankers have approached the challenges that this pandemic has brought, their shareholders expect quarterly returns and quarterly updates. And even though the first quarter into the pandemic, everyone expected a dip, what the shareholders wanted to hear was not how you're going to invest in technology, but how you're going to address the gap against what you had promised them when you didn't know the world was going to go through this Armageddon scenario um, and what it is you will be delivering now. It is how we're structured, it is how we measure things, and it cascades all the way down. The, the way that projects are prioritized, the way that budget is allocated, 
ties to that way of measuring and delivering updates on success and will forever be limited by it unless we start addressing the question at the top. And then the next thing is how we deliver value as a business. And I don't just mean how we do the good stuff. I mean how we price for the good stuff. So if the way we make money as a business is so tied to the old way of delivering solutions and pricing solutions, the, the tension between as we used to call it in innovation departments, change the bank and run the bank, becomes even more pronounced under duress. And this is not to criticize everyone or indeed anyone. It's to just highlight the obstacles potentially of our own making that, that keep things um, slow and hard inside banks. Now, those things are human made. And although they're changeable, they're not fast and easy to change, particularly as they are further complicated by things that were mentioned earlier. The first one is infrastructure. For better or worse, we've gone deep, we've gone wide, but we haven't gone all the way. And what we need in order to deliver those seamless digital services is plumbing, fully digital infrastructure that goes all the way down, that is not expensive to run, but is potentially expensive to build while you're running your old system. And therefore, it takes investment in time and money. And, and it needs to be ubiquitous and invisible, which means that you can't really celebrate the investment you've just made in a thing that is invisible because your clients were kind of hoping you had done that already. The second is economics and, and innovation teams and business teams all over the world have been working on this for a while. It's not cracked because it's not easy. Banks were profitable in a way that was very tied to their business model. Universal banks that could cross subsidize and package that could use their footprint in terms of scale, geography or volumes to create products that were bundled in a way that was good for the consumer and good for the bank in most cases. Those economics are being completely changed by regulation, margin compression, pressures, and the way that new technologies, or not so new technologies, demand that you change how you price. If you used to deliver reports to customers and get X number of bips for your efforts, and now all their data is exposed by APIs and they pay you by API call, there is no way you can make those numbers stack up, even if the quality of your service is the same. We need to work out the economics, not just the technology. And the last piece to, to state the obvious and the thing that keeps all innovation teams awake at night is brand permission. You need to do all of this without losing the credibility of your history and your size, but also without creating jarring experiences with um, the people who will become early adopters of your um, ever increasing um, credentials around digital capabilities. And I would say that some banks, without naming names, have done a great job in that, in taking their customers on the journey. And some banks have... Um, underestimated the suave user that doesn't just consume your PR, especially when you leave retail banking and go deeper into the stack. So what am I saying? I am actually saying that the opportunity is there and it is huge. My colleagues before me highlighted it. You all see it in your daily um, lives, both as, as professionals and as consumers of those services. The opportunity is real. The opportunity is huge. However, my old boss used to say, Opportunity has a problem of always looking like hard work when it comes to you and always looking like a wide open door when it comes to others. And what I wanted to take some time to do today and hopefully have, have succeeded in sort of highlighting is that the, the opportunity for banks is there and it is huge, but so is the effort we have to put in in order to capitalize on this opportunity and move from having a core business and innovation initiatives to transforming our business to meet the opportunity, because therein lies the rub. The opportunity that has come with the layering of the complexity we were carrying that is no longer ten tenable and the transition period we've been on and the pressures of COVID, the opportunity is to become truly digital businesses. There are some obstacles there, some human, some governance, some economic, and I don't mean financial, I mean economic, and some technological. Do I think we can uh, work through them? I absolutely do. Do I think they are easy? I absolutely don't. But I do think that the only thing equal to the size of the opportunity is the work that we have to undertake as an industry in order to meet it in a way that will satisfy 
the expectations that our regulators, our shareholders and our customers have. But I also believe we are equal to the task, provided we are get started as quickly as possible. Thank you very, very much for your time. Later, thank you very much for that too. Right, um, well, we're just going to bring everybody back up on grid, so the two Davids and Leda. Uh, and we're also going to introduce Ben Barbanel. So Ben is Head of Debt Finance at Oak North, who will be joining us for this panel. So if I could just ask Six Connect to bring everybody up on the grid, that would be fine. So we're going to do this question and answer session. It's worth pointing out that immediately after this, um, there are going to be four breakouts and delegates will select one session to attend and then we'll have lunch from 12.30 to 13.15. That's 1.15 in old money. Uh, hopefully you brought your own lunch, certainly I did. Right, we've got everybody back up. Ben, as we haven't heard you speak so far, would you like to say just a few words about yourself before we continue with the questions? Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, my name's Ben Barbanel. I head the debt finance team at Oak North Bank. Uh, we, for those of you that haven't heard of us, we are a relatively new challenger bank uh, lending in the UK. We got our banking license back in 2015. At the time, the third new bank in over 150 years. Um, we lend money only. Um, and since inception, we've lent nearly four and a half billion pounds now. Okay, that'll do very nicely by way of a catch up. So, thank you very much for that. Right, this first question is from Brian Davidson from Glasgow Credit Union, um, and it's aimed at David Bounceslag. Can you advise how the Bank of England is applying proportionality to the regulatory challenges that you cited? Because, uh, as you know, Brian points out, one size doesn't fit all. Um, thanks very much. I mean, this is actually something we really think for England. And we sort of have to balance two different things. One is, um, you know, the public rightly expects that all the financial institutions we regulate operate with a certain standard of sort of safety and soundness. They put their money in these institutions. But at the same time, we deal with a vast sort of difference in scale um, from, you know, as... Um, you mentioned sort of credit unions, some of which can be very large global banks. Um, so we do that in a number of different ways. We have different groups of people supervising them. So we have different teams with a lot of who operate a very different level of intensity in terms of the scrutiny that they place on, on different firms from some that they might visit once a year to others that they're talking to every single day. Um, we do also actually flex the rules. So credit unions have their own rule book. Um, that, uh, and we've tried to flex that as well um, for the banking sector. Now, we, there's some limits to our flexibility because um, it, within the European Union, there are rules that have to apply to everyone. Um, but leaving the EU actually does give us some possibilities to adapt that further, and that's something... I think we will look at quite carefully. Um, the other thing, also so specifically relevant to this conference, is trying to encourage new banks to start up. So what we did was we set up our very own new bank unit to help banks to go from concept to reality. I think we've been actually fairly successful in this. So we've we've had forty six new banks. Um, which have been authorised since 2013. It's quite a considerable number, and we hope that many of those will be successful and bring competition and innovation to the sector going forward. OK, thank you very much for that. Uh, next question, this is, I'm going to aim this first at you, David McClay, but I'd like other people's opinions on this too. From Richard Bradley, um, David makes an interesting point about the customers increasingly turning to digital channels. Does he see evidence that home-based customer services people are more able or empathetic with the shifting nature of the customer base? Does he envisage a mass return of their customer services team to the offices, contact centers, or some sort of hybrid environment with some of the offices and some continuing to work from home or in local community work hubs? Your thoughts, David? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. So, yeah, it's a good question, Richard. Um, the first point, um, do we see evidence that, that people are more empathetic? Um, not as yet, um, but our 
measures are generally they lag a little bit. So we have sort of net promoter scores where we'll contact customers who have contacted people um, to see how they're feeling about it. My hypothesis would be that it, they will be more empathetic. I think being outside the office environment, they're more likely to have a, a conversation with the customer. Um, we operate sort of frameworks as opposed to call scripts anyway. So they're, they're meant to have a conversation and kind of be led by the customer and, and engage with them. So I, I, my personal hypothesis would be in the home, that's going to work better than being in the office. But I may be wrong. I may be right. Um, do I envisage a mass return of customer service teams? Uh, no, uh, basically. Um, we're looking at all sorts of things at the moment. We're speaking to colleagues to see what they think. The consensus is more people would like to exclusively work from home or work from home to a greater degree. But then there are some people who definitely want to get back into the office. Um, so, yeah, that'd definitely be a hybrid, in my opinion, including potentially local community work hubs in our branches, perhaps. Um, and a change to the offices we do have, probably more collaborative spaces and, and bringing people in for specific um, planning and ideation type activity. But the, the broad grunt work, if you like, and I'll include myself in that, um, done away from traditional offices. Yeah, I think it'll plan out, but who knows? Who knows? Leda, do you think there's a sort of demographic divide here that where um, folk below a certain age are desperate to get back into the office and socialise, and folk above a certain age are quite happy to be antisocial and stay at home. Uh, you just have that. I don't know if you picked on me because of age, um, but uh, I. Uh, I no, I'm joking. I'm joking. And I, I actually, I, I've had this conversation recently. I think there are. Um, there are certain factors that have less to do with age and more to do with life circumstances. I, I have worked with people um, over the last few years who have families and live in spacious locations, uh, and they have loved the opportunity to spend that quality time with their children. Uh, similarly, people who live in less spacious locations but just became parents during this time are cherishing um, the time with their families. But I've also had young team members who had over-indexed on location and were living in flat shares with no communal spaces, and they were getting severe back pain at the age of 24 from working on their beds and going stir-crazy being stuck in a room. So I think that is definitely a, a factor that has a lot to do with um, a stage in life and socioeconomic circumstances and space, I think that absolutely is a, is a consideration that has absolutely an age component, but isn't just that. Um, the second piece that um, I, I, I don't hear talked about enough is that there are certain jobs that you do much better if you have peace and quiet. I mean, I tend to run teams of engineers and they're, they're like a, a long last. Um, but I can tell you that my job has become harder because my job is 99% of the time the harder conversations where I need to get a team member to tell me what's going wrong or ideally I need to see it before it goes wrong. And if, if I don't see anyone other than on one-to-one -one conversations or curated meetings, I might miss it. Negotiations, um, legal stuff, commercial stuff, those sides of things are um, definitely easier when you have that personal connectivity and in-person meeting. And I would also say that there is a potential loss, not of productivity, but of potential serendipity. The, 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 the sort of lateral creativity that you get when you're when you are in the office, and I think that's age agnostic. So very very um, very good question. I would say age is definitely a vector, but I think it's the other stuff underneath it that that drive it more: personal circumstances, nature of the role, um, and and sort of the practicalities of it, and and personal preference. Right? I like having humans around me. So even if I had the sort of head down job, I would still want to be in the room with all of you to get to know you as as people, not just as as voices with very clever things to say. Ben. Hi, yeah. Um, I mean, look, it's, um, it, it's a sign of the times. People will be working from home more for sure. Um, will that change our working habits going forward forever? I expect so. I think, as, as everyone said, it's a balance between, you know, ensuring those jobs that can be done at home without impact on mental health and deliverability and efficiency versus those that, that need to be done in an office in a team environment um, where you benefit from that kind of camaraderie and more in-depth social interaction. 
Um, you know, for us, we don't have call centers as such. Um, but one of the things we do, we have done historically, is um, all of our credit committees where we make the decision on whether we're going to lend money or not, our borrowers physically attend those, which is quite unique. Um, so that whole process has moved on to Zoom. Um, and it's been fine. It's worked. It's worked just as well. Um, you know, perhaps you don't pick up as much as the borrower body language uh, that perhaps we would see more of in the room, so to speak. Um, but for us, it hasn't been a problem. Um, and, you know, we're monitoring the situation carefully. I think, as Lida says, you know, our, our, our younger colleagues, perhaps the, if I can call them the, the flat sharers and the room sharers, who perhaps have been isolated in 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 rooms and and not had much um, living space, uh, were the more keen members of the team to get back to the office. Um, and those are the guys and girls that have taken up the offer of going back if if they want to so far. David, how much of this, or David Bonesnake, how much is this? Uh, um a matter of preference for the line managers too, because there's going to be some line managers that are confident having a team working from home and can handle that and adapt, and, you know, and, and some who really aren't. Um, I, I mean, I think there has been just a massive transition between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. So at the Bank of England, working from home has been something we've been trying to encourage for quite a long time. Um, but it's true to say some managers probably tended to discourage this a bit, when others were just very uh, welcoming, welcoming and open to this. But I think um, COVID-19 has transformed that. We've just seen how effective people actually are working from home. I think, in general, the quality of work has improved. We've become better at what we're doing, sharper, more focused. Um, and so, I think that will be something that will carry forward um, into the future. As people have said, um, the challenges are as much sort of social and personal, people feeling cut off, maybe not having those sort of ad hoc conversations about particular issues, um, or, or just feeling they need that social um, but my impression is that the attitude of managers has been completely transformed by this, and I don't think there'll be any reluctance uh, to continue these ways of working going going forward. Okay, yeah, another question now. This is from Simon Schofield. I've never had this phrase before, but I, when I read it, I thought, yeah, actually, I've been watching this for years. Leda, how many companies do you think really innovate versus those who just adopt innovation theatre? That's a lovely phrase, innovation theatre. Um, it's a good, it's, again, it's a, it's a very good question, but you knew that. Um, first of all, let me say that one does not preclude the other. Very often, uh, keeping up with the Joneses is why some of the big organizations started back in the day. Um, their innovation efforts, and they didn't intend to go very far or very deep, but actually, what happens once you hire the sort of people who want to do innovation jobs is that you create a problem for yourself because these people will badger away at you no matter how hard you make it to move things forward. And even though it's a bit of a, one of my team um, at BNY Mellon used to call it the corporate cha-cha, two steps forward, two steps backward, but we get somewhere. So I think even if you start with innovation theater, um, that does not mean that you will not get things done. But um. I think what was, um, I would say it's real of all the banks I have held innovation roles in and all the banks I have worked with either as a supplier or as a, as a sort of corporate um, partner, is that they started doing innovation at the time when everyone else did, believing that it was important, believing that it represented an avenue into the future, believing that they had to do a lot of accelerated learning, but not necessarily appreciating two things that have become apparent. One is it has to go all the way down and all the way across. And when these efforts started 10, 15 years ago, in some cases, 
I don't think anyone realized that. I'm not saying they resisted it, but I don't think they realized that. And the realization has not necessarily been easy and it has come with adjustments. Um, so what things, things that seem like innovation theater may not have been uh, intended as such. It was just a, a hope that you could do a little bit in a way that was controlled. The second big realization is that banks used to believe for a long time that they're in control of the what and the when. Um, both when technologies would be adopted and the tipping point when we would be okay with going live with certain with certain big implementations. And that has been proven to not be true, both because um, the regulator has created a very different beat that everyone has to move to, and also because challengers are no longer babies that you can dismiss. I mean, Oak North is, is a, is a grown-up player in the game. You, you wouldn't call it a a startup anymore. You wouldn't call it a challenger in the way that we used to. And I think those big things mean that um, innovation theater is absolutely non-viable, but I would also say that shallow innovation is not viable. And quite a lot of uh, the bigger banks have closed their innovation departments very quietly because the realization is the thing they were hoping could be contained and small can't, and they're not ready yet to go all the way. The ones who are still doing it have a lot of struggles internally, as I'm sure David would 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 would, would agree to, um, but are are trying to navigate a hard path to a complete transformation. Ben, you were nodding through some of that. Have you ever found yourself participating in innovative theatre or innovation theatre? I think that I'm, um, uh, you know, I spent 15 years of my 20 year career working in the big boys. And, um, you know, having then moved to a, what was at the time a startup um, with, a, with a strong tech focus, um, you know, it, it probably gives me uh, some strong opinion on this, qualified opinion. And I think, you know, the, the, the big issue for me here is that these big banks, it's just difficult to make change. It's just very, very difficult. And, you know, unfortunately, they're slow, they are bureaucratic, they are big cruise ships. And um, it's therefore difficult to navigate change. Um, and therefore, unfortunately, some of it is theatre. Um, some of it is pressurised theatre as well, because, you know, it looks good and it's supposed to be what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, that's the way it is. David McClay, question for you from Barney Nip uh, from Optum and Connect, saying, what are some of the most common reasons that you see innovations fail at Lloyds Banking Group? Yeah, good question. And just to tag on to the last one, yeah, we sometimes use the term innovation tourists. Um, we try not to be, you know, try just tour around, find a nice, nice, exciting thing and try it. So we gauge success by getting things live for customers. But what stops us doing that? Um, so a few things. One, um, Senior stakeholder buy-in, I, um, I think you really need to have a strong senior stakeholder that believes in your idea at the beginning, because what will come up, risks will come up, finance pressures will come up, and you really need that person um, to push through some of that stuff and, and unblock it. Um, but also, you need them at the beginning to understand your hypothesis and what you're measuring, so that when you get to the end of our experiment, they've got the info to make a decision. So they've got all the things that they need to actually say yes, and you don't just go, ah, can you try something else? Or, ah, can you go and speak to them? So it's, you've got the stuff, make a decision, do it, senior stakeholder gets it done. Um, internal challenge, we get a lot on the technology. So we have a number of enterprise systems across the bank, obviously, um, BPM systems like Pega, Workday, ServiceNow, we spend millions of pounds, tens and hundreds of millions of pounds on these and people want to stick with them and do things that they maybe aren't that great at. So bringing in a new, small, discrete bit of tech to do something can be challenging. Um, and I think the other thing, related to what Ben was saying, um, people don't necessarily like change, and they're a little bit scared uh, to do it and get it wrong. So the fear of failure is a big one. They don't want to be seen to go first. They're like, oh, what are our competitors doing? Have our competitors done it? Oh, okay, then maybe, no, okay, you may be onto something there. We'll try it. At which point, you're just following some yes, footsteps, which may be okay, but it does stop some of our more innovative things getting done. Sometimes you come back to them a couple of years later, and then people are more comfortable. Prove example, IoT devices in the home for general insurance, another example, perhaps, leak ball. Um, but yeah, that's three things, very quickly. You recognize those, David Bumstead? 
Um, yeah, I think so. Um, but one thing I suppose I would um, say is I think all organisations that survive are innovative to an extent. So I was just thinking about us at the Bank of England. You know, we've been around since 1694. We're not doing the same kind of things that we were doing then. So big organisations don't necessarily move as quickly as small ones. And I have worked in SMEs and startups as well. We tend to do things a bit slower. We're, we're, we're more, um, but, you know, in terms of a central bank, you would expect that. Different players in the economy have different functions. Startups and um, new innovators are there to try things. If they succeed, that's great. If they fail, um, that's, you know, that's manageable. If the central bank or a big um, high street bank suddenly falls over, um, you know, that's going to cause very widespread repercussions. So I think it's right that we're kind of relatively slow to change compared to other. Having said that, we do try and work with um, innovators. We That's why we have our FinTech Hub, to understand what is going on and hopefully to push those forward as well. Um, so I wouldn't be in the way cynical about how older, um, slow-moving organisations work. It's, it's the nature of the beast. It's the nature of uh, our economy. And I think having this sort of diverse mix of organisations is is what we need to progress in the future. So that's interesting what you just said, because, it, it, again, I'm paraphrasing here, or, or basically re-saying what you said. You know, our organisation is too big, too important, too central, to rush into things and fail. So having said that, if I were an organization that was slightly further down the line, I would want to try and mimic you. I would want to be the big boy. I would want to be the one that was too big and too successful to fail. So would that slow down my appetite for innovation? Are people copying you? Can I, can I jump in for a second? Yeah, come in. Sorry to, to, to interrupt that. I'd like to jump in because I, I, I I think there is um, a very common, I, I would say, error we make as an industry. And and if we change the words, the meaning of everything changes dramatically. We have tied innovation to failure. We have tied uh, innovation and failure to small entities. I would say that having a fintech hub doesn't actually help with innovation, doesn't protect from failure, and doesn't necessarily acceler accelerate learning. What you described, David, I, I recognize fully from my times in big banks, and I would say it's 100% true to the extent that a big organization with systemic significance absolutely has to be careful. But I would also say that quite a lot of the transformation we need to make has a biggest chance of failure if we don't make it, especially around um, system outages, around the resilience of some of the technology big, globally significant financial institutions are still relying on. But there is a danger that we've become accustomed to using the language of transformation, innovation, change with a higher index of risk. Certain technologies that would be pivotal to that change are no riskier than um, what we have now, and I would say in some cases actually quite a lot less risky. So although I totally agree with what you're saying, David, about the need to be cautious and the fact that things being slow is not, um, is not a bad thing, I would caution against um, innovation, failure, and out there change being bundled together because quite a lot of what um, – well, let, me, let me go back to the example I was using earlier. Cobalt-based technologies for loan disbursement is not – the best use of infrastructure. It is much less secure than a, um, an event-driven architecture that would have allowed you robust real-time changes that wouldn't have taken eight weeks of people being awake all night and all weekend to make those changes. So I agree with everything you said, but I would caution against that um, equation of, of innovation, transformation, and risky tech, because that, that is no longer the case for a lot of what we're looking at. I you mean, maybe if I can come back on that uh, briefly. I mean, I agree. I think there are risks of not changing as well as, as risks of changing. And, you know, that's why I suppose I, I used my example of uh, us existing since 1694. If we were still trying to do the same things 
that we were doing then, the public would have said, we don't need the Bank of England anymore. We need something else. Um, and we're also very mindful of technology. So, for instance, we're investing in um, changing our RTGS system, which sort of underpins a lot of the uh, banking system to ensure that it's robust and to ensure that it's, uh, it works. I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm just saying it's the nature of a big organisation that it is, or at least the nature of our organisation, we are quite, we're not going to be as quick as some other organisations to, to change. Um, and that we will look at things pretty changes. It's not that we don't want to change, it's not that we're not capable of changing. Um, I just think the pace with which you do that can be, can be different in different organisations. Do you, do you get the point I was trying to make, Ben, that essentially a willingness to embrace change or an unwillingness to embrace change can effectively become a badge or a, a, almost like a sign being held up saying, we are safe, we have history, we are big? Yeah, fully. I mean, I guess for an institution like the Bank of England, that you know that that's clearly what people want for for other parts of the financial ecosystem it's not necessarily as important you know i as a consumer i wouldn't want to see the bank of england being reckless with change and you know transforming overnight etc um for a new startup in today's environment um i would have thought that you know being at the forefront of technology etc is is where they need to be to get, to get <laughs> uh, buy-in and to get market penetration. Thoughts, but, David? Uh, the courses is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, is exactly the phrase I was going to use, actually. Horses, of course, as I think, one size definitely doesn't fit all in the sense things, and both, both, sizes, both horses could probably learn from each other, I suspect. Okay. Here's, here's an interesting question. Um, how do the panel see companies nurturing future leaders in a new working-from-home environment? How do we find our leaders of tomorrow with more stilted communication opportunities? Leader for a start. Um, I'll give you a slightly contradictory answer. The, the answer is that the way we interview and the way we, we scout talent hasn't really changed very much. And you can have the conversation over the phone. It's a little bit harder, but we've all hired people from different countries in the past without necessarily meeting them in person. Um, so I don't think finding leaders is, uh, is going to be the hard thing. Um, I think it's the nurturing young talent that will become harder. It's not impossible, but it will become harder because you can't lead by example the same way because quite a lot of things are invisible. You learn a lot by osmosis in an office, by seeing how people behave, how people um, interact, without necessarily being party to every interaction. One of the biggest lessons in leadership I ever received was in seeing my then chairman behave with immense respect to the most junior member of staff. That had nothing to do with me. I could miss it in today's Zoom world. So I think it's the, the, the grooming and the growth that is difficult. But people are trying different things, and whether we've succeeded or not, we won't know for a few years. Uh, it definitely needs to be a, a, an area of extra focus, though, as, as we're bringing younger people into a workplace that's distributed. Can you want to come in on that? I mean, I feel quite positive about uh, the new environment. I, I, I don't think we're shifting to a uh, process of working from home forever. I think we're able to use working from home and working in the office in a good mix to actually get the best out of uh, people. And for us, the crisis posed new opportunities. So more people, for instance, are able to join in and observe meetings of uh, senior levels than were before. So they can actually see how people people interact and they can, they can accelerate their learning. And I think people have also become more open. And that's another way of probably learning a bit more about how different people are thinking, behaving. So I see um, actually leaders emerging more effective the pandemic than they were before. Ben or David? I think, um, I think a leader is a leader and those strong qualities will, will come out in, in whatever medium they, they, they need to come out in. So, you know, there's tendencies that you can 
easily see displayed on a Zoom call. I think um, what, you know one of the issues is that you lose some of the EQ in this sort of forum, uh, which is difficult to pick up on and, and be aware of your surroundings, etc. David. Yeah, I think you know there's an assumption in the question that there will be more stilted communication opportunities. I think I agree with David that we'll probably have a better combination in the future of open, working out loud, technology-based initiatives that let more people comment and contribute and get seen as, as potential leaders of the future, and then we'll, we'll have the physical at some point as well that we need. Okay. Well, so thank you very much for your input, all of you, and thank you very much for your presentations, David Bumslug, David McClay, Ben Barbanel, and Lady Gliptus. Thanks. Thanks for your time this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Barrow. <laughs> uh, now, just going to say, um, there's going to be a 15-minute break now. Um, the next session starts bang on midday, theoretically. There's going to be four breakouts. You can select one session to attend. Uh, and after breakouts, we will have lunch from 12.30 to 1.15. As I said earlier, I hope you brought your own, because certainly we did. Um, but take a chance, too, just to sort of chat with your peers and visit the exhibitors area. Um, we will be back in 15 minutes, roughly. But thanks again for dropping in.